It's an overload. It's an overload. Amen. Thank God for great exhortation, great song ministry coming to us uh, this morning as we get to the final part of our morning session today. It's already afternoon, so it's an afternoon session now. Uh, and uh, after this, we close for the evening session. But I'm so excited uh, for our next speaker who is coming up. Uh, Bishop Mike needs no introduction in this house. Uh, he is a man who is truly beloved, truly appreciated. Uh, he is a veteran in the kingdom of God. Uh, at his age, he should be retired twice over. But he is refired and still working for the Lord. Uh, he's going to be 78, I think, next month. Uh, so, some of you, your grandfathers are sitting in the village doing nothing. And uh, he is here still pushing for the kingdom of God, still working hard, preaching with vigor, uh, traveling all over the world. Uh, he has served the Lord very faithfully all these years. He's a man I truly respect, value, have great admiration for. Um, he is the head, uh, the general overseer of the Redeemed Evangelical Ministry, uh, TREM, in Lagos, Nigeria, that is spread all over the world, and he keeps traveling. He keeps being a great uh, gift to the body of Christ. For us in ICGC, He's a man we truly love, respect, and appreciate. So it's my great honor to welcome a great general of God's kingdom, Bishop Mike Okonkwo. Bishop of the Redeemed Evangelical Mission, headquartered in Lagos, Nigeria, with churches planted across the globe. He is an elder statesman in the Christian body whose influence touches the continent of Africa and the rest of the world. Bishop Mike Okonkwo is the convener of the Communion of Covenant Ministers International. He is a trustee and also a member of the National Advisory Council of the Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria. He is a dynamic conference speaker, crusade evangelist and a TV and radio host. He is a strong and respected voice all over Africa. We must change the narratives. As gospel. Greater works. Let's welcome Bishop Mike Okonko. Your hands and shout hallelujah. If you are alive, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. Wow, when I came in here yesterday night, I couldn't but I felt like just rolling on the floor. This awesome, awesome building. Come on. Doc, thank you so much for being an instrument in the hands of God. From Africa, not from America. Africa. What we are seeing is not in the United States, it's in Accra, Ghana. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Celebrate yourself. You know, it's only in Western world you see things like this. But we are alive to see God telling us that we are not inferior. Amen. Amen. We are not inferior to the Western world. The same God over all is rich unto all that believe in him. No difference. And so we must not discount ourselves. I thank God for you, Doc. You are a blessing to our continent. And I don't say this lightly or one of the protocols of what we say as preachers. I'm telling you what I know is true. There is no time I've sat around dog that I don't receive wisdom. You can't sit around him and not, and not be moved to another level. So I really give God the 
praise and honor and adoration for your life, your commitment, your sacrifice, your dedication, for being a voice to the nations. That voice will not be silenced. It will continue to reverberate all over the nations of the world. We are proud of you and the Lord will keep on keeping you. I thank God for all the leadership of the ICGC. It's joy. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just happy to be here. Even if I don't get to speak, I'm, I'm just happy to be here. I like to be where it is happening. I hope you know it's happening here. Amen. And so we thank God and all the choir, all the ministry, Pastor Matthew has been bombarding this place. I was just praying that he doesn't use up all the anointing. <laughs> I thank God for him. For Pastor Matthew is all over the world. I wonder how he's keeping up. Just like two of Bismarck. Both of them are all over the place. But thank God that God is keeping them alive. Amen. All the choir that have ministered dynamic. And you see, I, I've said it over, the, over and over. If you want to do something, do it. Don't, 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 don't be alive as if you are dead. If you want to die, die. Let's know you are dead. If you want to live, live. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. I'll be sharing with us very briefly on what I have titled the response of the grace-filled life. The response. What's the response? What do we do as those that have been graced by God? How do we handle ourselves? Because it's very important. Father, we bless your name. We exalt you for your loving kindness, your faithfulness. Thank you because I'm anointed to teach this word. And the hearts of your people, their eyes and their ears are anointed to receive, retain the mysteries of the kingdom. Thank you because no one will live here the same way he came. You will touch, heal, deliver and set free and move them to another level. And we covenant that the glory, the honor, the adoration is ascribed to you. And everyone that believes the prayer, say loud, amen. Glory to God, you may be seated. I'm going to read two scriptures as a foundation, then we're going to dig into it under. Romans chapter 2 verse 4, and of course Titus chapter 2 from a verse 11. Romans 2 from verse, uh, from verse 4, I mean just verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Is that, what translation is that? Is that New King James? Give me King James. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearing and, lo uh, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? The goodness of God, not his judgment, not his anger, not his wrath. It is his goodness that leads to repentance. And repentance there does not mean, I'm sorry. The repentance there is talking about you changing your mind and following what way he is determining for you. It is his goodness that leads, that, that teaches us how to live for him. Titus chapter 2 from verse 11. Titus 2 from verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation, it is God's grace that brings salvation, had appeared to all men. In other words, no one has an excuse. Everyone 
has been given the opportunity to experience and partake of the grace of God. And what does he teach? Teaching us, it is this grace that teaches us that denying ungodliness and the worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Next verse. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The grace teaches, because one of the challenges today in the message of grace is that people are thinking that grace tells you to live anyhow. Grace says do anyhow and grace has covered you. And people are sort of pushing back when they hear that. But what I often say to people is that it's lack of understanding because if you truly enjoy the grace of God, if you truly have experienced the grace of God, if you know what cool grace is, you will never, never, never want to go back to sin. You will not. So I tell people when people say that it's a license to sin, I say, well, that means that the person does not even know grace. The scripture tells us in John chapter 1, 16 and 17, that of his fullness have we all received grace for grace, grace for grace, grace upon grace. Therefore, we are all products of grace as believers. We started with grace, we are standing in grace, and we are going to complete in grace. Can I hear an amen? amen. The scripture tells us again that we should be established. It is good for the heart. That is in Hebrew chapter 13 verse 9. It is good for the heart to be established in grace. It is good. Second Peter chapter 3, 18. It's a growing grace. You see, grace is like the sandwich that puts everything, every other thing together. Because if you remove grace, every other thing will fall apart. Like sandwich. Because if you study the book of Paul's letters, you will notice that he often opens up with grace. Grace and mercy be unto you. Grace and peace be multiplied. And then he ends up with grace. So everything is held together in that very, very message, in that very grace that God has given to us. So if you remove it, every other thing will fall apart because the church needs to understand this because I'm tired of struggle by the church. People are, they love God with all their heart. They believe God. They want to live for God. They want to ensure that they are guaranteed that if they breathe the last, they are in heaven. And yet they are agitated, frustrated, discouraged. They know that something is missing. And I found that, that what is missing is lack of understanding of what has already been done on our behalf. We are not supposed to struggle as children of God. We are not supposed to be like the world. We must leverage on something bigger. But in the, the, this, listen, the world is spiraling downwards. Every other thing is fully failing. We are living in a time when there is violence, bloodshed, wickedness on the increase. And you are asking yourself, how do you survive if God does not help you? But I thank God there is help for us. I said there is help for us. The grace of God. The Bible tells us, for we are saved by grace. Through faith. Even your salvation is by grace. It's not by your effort. It's not by your performance. It's not by your doing. Our preacher on exhortation just spoke to us now about sacrifice. You see, when you understand grace, sacrifice becomes a worship. It will not be a struggle. Whatever you do in the kingdom, you will understand that, listen, it's a response to the, the goodness of God that already have been deployed on your behalf. And so no struggle. 
you'll be willing. It's not a matter of you have to. You have to. No, it will be a case of I want to. Because I understand what he has done on my behalf. Can I hear loud amen? amen? You know, Paul was telling the elders in Ephesus when he was going to Jerusalem. He said, now in Acts 20, 20 32, I commend you to our God and the word of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those that are sanctified. In other words, it's the word of his grace that builds up. Not the words of accusation or shame or disgrace or humiliation or embarrassment. The word of his grace. And understand, grace is unearned, undeserved, unmerited. It's not about your connection or what you did or what you didn't do. I'm tired of people flaunting their credentials before God. Hear this. You have no credentials. Our credential is Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. Jesus. Shout it again, Jesus. Jesus. He's our credential. Once you have him, you are qualified. He is the one that qualifies the ungodly. Can I hear a loud amen? amen. A louder amen. amen. Grace of God. Paul says, I've been given, Ephesians 3, 2, that dispensation to preach unto the Gentiles. That I've been given this dispensation of grace to be preached to them. It's my part that the body of Christ will know. And you understand that Paul was a religious man, highly religious. He was a Pharisee, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin. And he says to us, he concerning the law, he was blameless. When he comes to righteousness by the law, he was blameless. And concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. But one day on the road to Damascus, he got a hold of grace. He saw grace. Grace visited him. Grace reached out to him. And he decided that every other thing would be counted as what? Done. When you encounter grace, Every other thing will lose value. Money will lose value. You will not desire anything. You will not desire loss. You will not desire carnality. You will not desire it. Not because anyone is policing you. But because you have encountered something bigger than you. That's what we are talking about. That's what God in this life, I believe, if there was what church needed today, it's for us to leverage on the grace of God. You cannot do anything without grace. Paul says, I am what I am by how? By the, by the grace of God. Whatever I achieve is by the grace of God. Now, notice his response. Put it on the screen. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. You see his response. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Okay. But by grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. You see that? See his response. The grace I received was not in vain. What did he lead you to do, Paul? I labored more what? Abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Can I hear a loud amen? It will drive you to do more. You will not be tired. No one will begin to, you know, massage you and, and plead with you. Can you do this? No. Because it's a motivation that comes from inside. You just notice that you can't really do enough. Can I hear a loud amen? amen? The church must awake with brutality. The, 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 the goodness of God on our behalf. We must awake with it. P -p Jesus, Paul writes to Ephesians in chapter 2, uh, chapter two verse 7. He, say, he said in the ages to come, God wants to show us. He said, look at these ones. 
Look at these ones which are nobodies. Look at what their lives are turned into. Your life is turning around. I said it's turning around. It is to come. He might show. He wants to put you on public display. The exceeding riches of the grace in his kindness toward us through Christ. Can I have it in passion translation? Do you have passion translation? Huh? Do you have a, Okay, if you don't have it, can I have it in New Living Translation? Oh, okay, you have it in passion translation. Throughout the coming ages, we will be the visible display of the infinite, limitless riches of his grace and kindness which was showered upon us in who? In Christ Jesus. Glory to God. Come on, give him a good God bless you. In Hebrew 4.16, he said, let us come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy that we might have grace for help at every time of need. In other words, stop running from the throne of grace. It's not throne of judgment. God is not looking for hammer to break your head. No. He paid for it. And so it's his assignment to ensure that we're embraced. That's his purpose. That's his plan. Come boldly. And when you get there, stand boldly there. Start running. Because the lie of the devil is to make you run from God. That's his lie. All through the scripture you will see. From Genesis to Revelation. You see God's goodness. And I found out that it was God's goodness that made people live right. <laughs> Glory to God. Throughout the scriptures. No one wanted to talk, touch Tama. You know Tama, who committed incest with the father-in-law in the scriptures. You know Ruth. You know Rahab. You know Bathsheba. All those is what the world will call bad, bad girls. Yeah, bad girls. But I, I keep on wondering, why should God pick these people? Oh, there is hope for you. Because when you read the Old Testament, you will think that that's how their lives ended. But drop down to Matthew chapter 1 from verse 3 to 6. You will see their names there. All in the lineage of Jesus Christ. All in their lineage. You see, we must stop this name and shame that we are having. That's why the church is not strong. Name him and shame him. Drive them out of the church. When we preach the grace of God to the world, they will fill our churches with our struggle. But what we're going to do is to tell them, get rid of your sin so that you can be accepted. But that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. The gospel tells you what has been done for you. It doesn't tell you what is wrong with you. It's religion that tells you what is wrong with you. But the gospel tells you what is right with you. And when it tells you what is right with you, then you will live right. <laughs> Glory to God. Read the Bible all through from Genesis to Revelation. They were built basically on the heels of who are, those who are murderers. Moses was a murderer. David was a murderer. Paul was a murderer. And you can't preach the scriptures without referring to all these people. They were murderers. 
and yet God chose them as instruments. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. In 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14, we often say the grace of our Lord and apostolic benediction. He said the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The grace of, it starts with grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, how do we respond? Because my concern is the response of grace. How do we respond to the grace of God in our lives? When he has displayed so much grace for us, unearned, unmerited, undeserved, what's our response of grace? Are you going to reinvent the wheel? Because I see people trying to say, if I, if I do this, God will do this for me. It's because you don't understand grace. And so your struggle continues because you can never do enough. You can't do enough. <laughs> In Galatians 5, 4, listen, look at what Galatians 5, 4 says. Galatians 5, verse 4. Listen to what he says. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you just, are justified by the law. What happens? What happens? You are falling from grace. When you are trying to impress God. Listen. Christianity is not what we do. So that we can be acceptable to God. No. Christianity is what God has done for us. To be acceptable to him. He has done it. You did not die for your sins. While we are yet sinners. Huh? While you are still messing around. He said, I will die for them. What a grace. While we are messing around. He said, he said I still love them. Ezekiel put it this way. He said, when you were born. Ezekiel chapter 16. He said, they dumped you. No one wanted to touch you with a 10-foot pole. He said, but I came. I washed you. I cleansed you. He was the one doing it all the time. For he who has begun a good work in us. We complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You did not start this, this journey. Well, so why are you trying to put your hand inside it? He started it. You don't know anything about salvation. He's the one that reached out to you. We did not find him. He found us. Glory to God. He found us. You are chosen from among equals. So how dare you reduce yourself to a nothing when heaven has chosen you? Somebody shout, I am blessed. Shout it again, I am blessed. You see, what I'm sharing with you will make you walk in the type of liberty and boldness you have never known. The devil will not be able to accuse you one more day. For there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? I am excited that grace found me. I am excited that grace is keeping me. I'm excited that grace is taking me over every challenge, every difficulty. Can I hear a loud amen? Yeah. Are you, how do you expect to run with the world? Doc, you see, I am tired. Each time I look at the world, it's unfortunate that the church keep on citing the world as example. It's an insult and an abuse to redemption. The church is not peripheral to the world. It's the world that's peripheral to the church. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We are the temple of God. How can we be copying the world? When you want to talk about those who are billionaires inside the world, how many believers are billionaires? Think of it. Does it then mean that our God has abandoned us. There's something we don't know. 
We think that we've got to go through the entire meal like every other person. No. There is what is called overtaker's grace. They may have gone ahead of you, but the grace of God will take you from the backside and put you in the front line. Hallelujah. We must begin to leverage. Leverage on the grace. Celebrate the grace. Access their grace. And not begin to think, I must do this so that God will do this. If I don't do this, God will not do this. It's already done. <laughs> I say it's already done. I said it's already done. Glory to God. I'm just laying foundation. If I don't get to finish, my time is up. I continue tomorrow night. It's already done. Jesus on the cross said, it is what? Finished. Shout it, it is finished. Shout it again, it is finished. God declares the end from the beginning. He has declared it from the beginning. You are not going to begin anything. Our journey is such that the winner is already declared. Can I hear loud amen? How do you want to take an exam and they're already telling you you are first class? You've not started, you've not taken the exam. And they say whatever it is, head or tail, you are first class. <laughs> it can only be grace. It's not your effort. Enough of agitation amongst us. Enough of struggle, worry, stress up, developing hypertension. Because we are not willing to rest. Let him do the work. He that keepeth us does not what? Slumber. It does not sleep. Why are you awake? Two of you cannot be awake. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hmm. Let us interrogate. I show you a few examples from the scriptures. In Genesis, Chapter number three. You all know the story. Adam had no part in the creation of the heavens and the earth. It just, God just decided, let us make what? Man. In our image. It was God's choice. Adam did not beg him. In fact, there was no Adam. And God said, to the Godhead, let us make man, think of it. Let us make man like us, to function like us with our nature and our ability. Think of it. No effort from Adam, and he was made. And by the time God opened his mouth, what he did was, he blessed them. Somebody say, I am empowered. Say it again. Say it again. That's what bless me. Empower to succeed. Not empower to fail. Not empower to be disappointed. You must succeed. I said you must succeed. I said you must succeed. That's God's original intention and it has not changed. Romans 11, 29, that, God, that, that God's gifts and calling are irrevocable, can never be rescinded. So your success is already a predetermined thing before you were born. He empowered them. He said, because you are empowered, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue the earth, and walk in dominion. In other words, dominion mandate is all over us. And many of us are walking like mere men. You have a dominion mandate and you refuse to exercise it. 
and the enemy is pushing you here, push you there, and you accept. He empowered them. And I watch this in chapter 2. God made the form and breathed on him. And the Bible says man became what? A living soul. When man opened his eyes, his first encounter was God. In other words, Adam, you are like me. As long as you see, as, as long as you, you see your reality in me, all these things will be subject to you. In other words, there was no doubt, there was no ambiguity as to the identity of Adam. But here comes the devil and said to him, you know, as God told you that, that if you eat, you are going to die. God knows the day you eat, you are going to be like him. What he was already. And my question to us, who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? And God came in chapter 3, as usual, from verse 8 and said, let us fellowship the way we used to fellowship. Question, question. Talk about grace. Question. Did God not know that Adam has sinned? Huh? He knew. And yet he came to a sinner. Not only that he came to a sinner. Religion tells us that when you do something wrong, you will no more hear from God. The Holy Spirit leaves you. But Adam was able to, just, to know that God was what? Speaking to him. He was still able to hear the voice of God. I heard your voice. I was afraid. Because I'm naked. Then the next statement God made it blew my mind. Who told you? Who told you that what? You are naked. <laughs> Listen to me, beloved ones. Until God says you are naked. Listen. Even if it appears you are naked, don't accept you are naked. In other words, on, who, Adam, I knew you fell. <laughs> it, it, when you fell, I knew. So I'm not confused. And yet I came to you. Who told you? You have not heard it from my mouth that you are naked. It's because you accepted that you are naked that you become naked. For as a man thinketh in his heart. A lot of believers as I travel the world are falling for the lie of the devil. You allow the devil to define you. Who told you that your life and relationship with God stops because you messed up? If you run from God, who will save you? Who else will deliver you? Who can cleanse you? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. Any believers are running from God because of the voice of the devil they had. You are a prostitute. You are a liar. You are an adulterer. You are a thief. And you are in church. And you are allowing this voice on condemnation. As long as you keep on hearing the devil and fail to rise up in the brutality of your righteousness, even, in the, even at the face of apparent disappointment, failure, the enemy will keep you trapped. Your nature does not change because you messed up. No. See what God did next. God himself. The guy was covering himself with leaves. Self-effort, self-righteousness. 
doing. Let me do so that God can forgive me. Let me do this. No. God did what? Killed an animal. God killed, not him. And covered him. This was a man who spat on his face. A man who said to him, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't do what you said. Religion would have just written him off. But God said, I see that I see believe in you. <laughs> Put your hand on your chest, declare it, God believes in me. Say it again. Say it again. That's grace at work. Because God is grace. Grace is God. The Bible said the law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace, which is truth. So you can't be talking about truth outside grace. Jesus is the truth. And the way, the definite article, the truth and the light. Not a truth. The. That's the finality. So I choose to listen to what Jesus said. Many of you are living by what the law said, what they said concerning other things. But the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the final revelation of who God is. If you want to know God, know Jesus. If you want to know his character, know Jesus. Not any other thing. Jesus is the finality. All others have just a glimpse of what, who, of who God is. And they describe God according to their experience. Look at what Hebrew chapter 1 from verse 1 says. Look at Hebrew chapter 1 from verse 1. Look at it in the uh, Amplified Classic Version. Hebrew chapter 1. Amplified, amplified God who has sundry times and in diverse manner. In many separate ways. See that. Each of which set or each of which set forth what? A portion of the truth. In other words, it's not the complete truth. A portion of the truth. And in different ways. God spoke of old to our fathers in and by the prophets. Portion. So if you are running with just portion, you don't have the complete truth. He said, but in the, in the last of these days, he has spoken to us in the person of a son. Whom he appointed heir and lawful owner of all things. Also by and through whom he created the walls and the riches of the space and the ages of time. He made, produced, built, operated and arranged them in order. Now watch this. He is the sole expression of the glory of God. The light being, the outraying of radiance of the divine. And he is the perfect imprint and the very image of God's nature. Upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. When he had, by offering himself, accomplished our cleansing of sins and redance of guilt. He sat down. At the right hand of the divine majesty. He is the final answer. He's the final. The other day, Jesus took his disciples to the Mount of, Mount of Transfiguration. And Moses was there, Elijah was there. And Peter, who had just very little understanding of the message of grace because it was not given to him. Let us build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I call him a DJ. 
You say, brother, my wife is a DJ. Let's mix all of them together. Mix them. And then we shocked. Most of the pulpits around the world are DJs. Mixing the law and the grace. And the church is frustrated. They are asking, why is it not working? We are dwelling on what the Bible calls the fading glory. God helping me tonight, I'll just share a little bit more on that. That's what we're doing. Mix it. And before he could finish, heaven said, shut up. Shut up. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Don't, any, if whatever any other person has told you, until it is clarified by him, don't take it as true. He is the image of the invisible God, an express image of his person, brightness of his glory, manifesting his radiance to the entire world. Hallelujah! And Jesus said to the people going from the, on their way to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, he said, beginning from Moses to Psalms to the prophets, he said, all these things are talking about me. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. They are they who speak of me. That's what it is. Jesus is the image. And he said you shall know the truth. And the truth shall what? Make you free. It is the truth that will make you free. You will remain free forever. Amen. Allow the amen. amen. Abraham found grace. Abraham was minding his business in Genesis 11 and 12. Minding his business. In fact, he has come to the age of retirement. Expecting to end and die in where his father died. Here comes grace. You will not die where your father died. Your story will not end where your father stopped. And God called him, Abraham, get thee out of thy kindred, your family, your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you great. I'll bless you. I'll bless those who bless you and cause those who cause. Grace. Abraham did not beg. Abraham did not provoke God. Abraham did not struggle. God said, I, I will do it. You know the story? Abraham came out of the oh, Cadiz. And then Abraham in, in his natural man. You know, we always talk about Abraham, the father of faith. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't just was called and then faith, bam. No, he doubted. You know the story. You know how he went to, into Hagar. And the Bible says for the next 13 years, God never spoke to him. And I was asking God, why did you not speak to him? He said, because I wanted to do what, you know, some of you cause your own delay. He said, I wanted to meet him at the point of his name. I wanted him to know it's only me that can do it. But I found out that he's still alive. Because if he's not alive, how can he go into Hagar? Is he, is he was strong enough to go into Hagar until he dies? You know, he doesn't want anyone to share in his glory. He said, I will wait until he's dead and dead. And so God waited for until he was 100. And Romans records that he was dead. The wife was dead. And here comes God. I've made you a father of many nations. Before whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead and called those things which be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope that he would become a father of many nations according to what was 
spoken. Not according to his body. What was spoken. Some of you need to die. For what God said concerning you to happen. You know, brother, I say, what do you mean by that? It means stop trusting yourself. Stop trusting your connection. Stop trusting the, that people around you. Tired of believers, I'm, 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 I'm trusting God, I'm believing God. And he's believing God based on a, a brother he has seen in the church. <laughs> if you are believing God, go to bed. Tell your neighbor, go to bed. Tell him, go to bed. <laughs> now, when eventually in chapter 22 of Genesis, and God visited Sarah as he has said, and God did unto Sarah as he has spoken. That's why I can declare to you, whatever God has spoken in your life, they shall come to pass. They shall come to pass. They shall come to pass. Now, Abraham was blessed with Isaac, the son of laughter, the son that gave him joy. And in chapter 22, here comes God. Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, that one that is causing you joy, that you waited for, for 25 years. That one that you fasted and prayed and you finally got. Take him to a mountain that I will show you. Sacrifice him to me. What did Abraham do? Abraham said, I know the way you read it is that, remember I'm talking about the response of grace-filled life. Some of us will say, God, I didn't hear your voice. This is not you. <laughs> Why should you? You know how long I waited. Let me, let, let me keep this one. Some of you are keeping what should be torn loose. And you are wondering where you, why you are limited. Why you are limited. The scripture says, Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and cleaved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. Early, quick obedience. That's the response of a grace-filled life. It, he was not manipulated. He knew that the only son was Isaac. Yet, he took him early. That's a person who understood grace. Because grace teaches you. The grace of God that has appeared teaches us to do what is right. You know the story? You know the story of what transpired. And God, and as Abraham was moving on, Isaac said, you know, we have the wood, we have the fire, we have everything with us, but where is the sacrifice? He said, look, God himself will provide. <laughs> oh God. That, it's not me that will provide. It is God himself. The grace that gave him to me, that grace will provide. That's what grace does. It will make you, it's our positive response to the goodness of God. It's a positive, joyful, not struggling, joyful response to be counted. Positive, joyful response to be able to lay hold. That's what grace does. 
Don't listen. Don't ever listen to majority of the people that are going about with strange doctrines. What they want to do is to change you from living in grace. They want to change you so that you'll be struggling with your Christian experience. When you understand it, everything loses value. No one will beg you to give your tithes. No one will beg you to give your offerings. No one will beg you to give seed faith. No one will beg you to give towards building. In fact, the more you give, the more you find out that you have not even done enough. Can I hear a loud amen? amen? Positive response. He has reached out to me with grace. He has called me right. And because he has called me right, right people do right. That's what happens. I understand. He, I know me. I know me. And yet he called me right. If he called me right, then my positive response is to do right. And when I do right, listen, I don't become perfect overnight. What happens is that I'm walking in the truth. And so the spirit of truth will now assist me from within to be able to walk in it as a lifestyle because it's the spirit of truth. When you doubt him, you will never walk in it. The just shall... By what? By what? By what? In other words, even when you are seeing contradictory evidence around you, contradictory behavior, don't change your stance with God. Your stance still remains constant. And as you do, what happened? The Holy Spirit is working on the inside and he work it out on the outside. He said, work out your own what? Savage. With fear and what? Trembling. And that's where many stop. The Bible says, work out your translation. How can you work out something you didn't start? Yeah. How can you work out something you didn't start? Work out your own salvation with trembling and fear. No. Work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. That means you already have the salvation. You already have it. Because you can't work out what you don't have. Are you following me? With fear and trembling. Okay. But it continues the next verse. For it is God, the one that started this journey, that is at work in you, both to desire and to do of his good pleasure. He's the one. And so what do I do? My eyes are on him. The Bible says to us in Hebrew chapter 12, he said, let us therefore lay aside every sin and every weight that so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How? Looking. Looking at your reality. Looking unto who? That, he said, that's your reality. The author and the finisher <laughs> of your faith. They looked unto him and their faces were enlightened and they were not ashamed. There is no way you can be looking unto him and you'll be ashamed. You can never. Because we all with open face beholding his glory. As in the cross, we are beholding are being changed into the same image. From glory to glory. I'll continue there tomorrow. Stand to your feet. Come on, stand to your feet. Give Jesus a big clap offering. Hallelujah! The grace of God has found you where you are, empty-handed, that we are alive in his hands. Majesty, majesty. He found us. He found me. 
I was running, he found me. I cannot outrun him. He found me. You will never outrun grace. Grace will always locate you. And I declare over your life, your days of struggling with your Christian life is over. It is over. True knowledge shall the church be delivered. True knowledge. When you have understanding, deliverance is it's not until people begin to roll and vomit. No. Not until they roll and, and, and begin to vomit, run all over the place. Not until, not until they want to prophesy and say, mm, please, please, my friend, without doing, mm, you can prophesy. <laughs> we have built a lot of things into the church that should not be. Can I hear loud amen? amen. That's why you, you can't be in ICGC and join that type of crowd. Because if you do, I wonder what's wrong with you. How can you, how can you be in such a glorious, excellent, magnificent a heavy church like this. It's not everything you watch on television. There are some, there are some, some things you must delete. Can I hear loud amen? amen? Coming to a church like this, what else am I looking for? There is no way I cannot excel. Blessed is are your ears that are hearing what you are hearing there. A loud amen. amen. I declare by you no more struggle in your life. Amen. No more frustration in your life. Amen. You will testify. Amen. And I will hear your testimonies. Amen. A louder amen. amen. Come on, shout three hallelujahs. Glory to God. Put your hands together for me. Okay. Let's welcome the conference speaker. You want to sit down or you go? Let's honor God. Let's honor God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. Amen. Well, uh, he said, when you understand grace, you will give and not complain.